Welcome to this session of Cranmer Studies. I trust this is working. We're now with <coughs> William Tyndale in his preface to the Pentateuch, 1530. And even in the bishop's house, I intended to have it done. <clears throat> For when I so turmoiled in the country, when I, where I was, that I could no longer dwell there, I, this wise thought myself, this I suffer because the priests of the country are so unlearned. They are full of the ignorant sort, which have seen no more Latin than they read in their portices and missals which many of them scarcely can read. Though they never be sorely learned, they pour day and night and make notes therein and teach the midwives. A book of continuations to gather tithes, mortuaries, offerings, customs, and other pillage, which they call not theirs, but God's part and the duty of the Holy Church to discharge their consciences therewith. For they are bound that they shall not diminish, but increase all things to the uttermost of their powers. And therefore, because they are thus unlearned, thought I, when they come together in the alehouse, which is their preaching place, they affirm that my sayings are heresy. And besides that, they add to their own heads, which I never spoke, as the manner is to prolong the tale to short the time with all and accuse me secretly to the chancellor and others of the bishop's officers. And indeed, when I came to the chancellor, he threatened me grievously and reviled me and rated me as though I had been a dog and laid my charge whereof there could none accuser be brought forth as their manner is not to bring forth the accuser. And yet all the priests of the country were the same day there. After this, I thought, the Bishop of London came to my remembrance, whom Erasmus, whose tongue maketh of little gnats great elephants, and lifteth up above the stars, whosoever giveth him a little exhibition, praises exceedingly, among other, in his annotations on the New Testament for this great learning. Then I thought that I, if I might come to this man's service, I were happy. And so I get me to London, and through my acquaintance of my master came to Sir Harry Guilford, the King's Grace's controller, and brought him an oration of Isocrates, which I had translated out of Greek into English, and desired him to speak unto my Lord of London for me, which he also did, as he showed me, willed me to write an epistle to my Lord, and go to him myself, which I did also, and delivered my epistle to a servant of his, one William Hebblewaite, a man of mine own acquaintance. But God, which knoweth what is within hypocrites, saw that I was beguiled, and that counsel was not the next way unto my purpose, and therefore he got me no favor in my Lord's sight. Whereupon my Lord answered me, his house was full. He had more than he could well find and advised me to seek in London, for he said I could not lack a service. And so in London I abode almost a year and marked the course of the world and heard our praetors, I would say our preachers, how they boasted themselves of their high authority and beheld the pomp of the prelates and how busy they were. <clears throat> to set peace and unity in the world, though it be not possible for them that walk in darkness to continue long in peace. They cannot but either stumble or dash themselves at one thing or another that shall see, shall unclean, unquiet altogether and saw things whereof I defer to speak at this time, and understood at the last 
Not only was there no room in my Lord of London's palace to translate the New Testament, but also there was no place to do it in all of England, as experience doth now openly declare. When we turn to Prof. Philip Hughes's Theology of the English Reformers, in preaching and worship, and he's speaking of Latimer here extensively. Latimer is speaking feelingly, for he himself had been accused of preaching indiscreetly and even seditiously. Not that he had no patience with discretion, but he was unwilling to use discretion at the expense of truth. I know that preachers ought to have discretion in their preaching, he says, and that they ought to have consideration and respect to the place and time that he preacheth in. As I myself will say here what I say not in the country for no good. But what then? Sin must be rebuked. Sin must be plainly spoken against. And when should Jonah have preached against Nineveh if he had foregone for the respect of times, place, and state of things? Sin had to be rebuked there and judgment denounced against the unrepentant, just as in London, where Latimer was preaching. The city of Nineveh believed the word of God, proclaimed through God's preacher in Christ when rebuking the wickedness of his generation, declared that the people of Nineveh would rise up against the Jews in the last day and testify against them. So too Latimer dealt faithfully with his generation and earnestly uttered this warning. I say Nineveh shall rise against England, thou England. Nineveh shall rise against you because you believe it will not believe God, nor hear his preachers that cry daily unto them, nor amend their lives and especially their covetousness. Latimer's example. In Hughes Latimer, we have a noble model of a Christian preacher who diligently applied himself to the fulfillment of his high calling and was faithful even unto death. But we will let his servant, Augustine, burn her as himself a preacher of the word speak from firsthand knowledge of that same reverend father and most constant martyr of Christ. Dr. Hugh Latimer, my most dear master, for whose most painful travails, faithful preachings, true carefulness for his country, patient imprisonment and constant suffering the whole realm of England, hath great cause to give unto the eternal God most high laud and praise. Did God appoint him, asks Berner, even in King Henry's days, to be a singular instrument to set forth his truth and by his preaching to open the eyes of such as were deluded by the subtle and deceitful crafts of the Polish or Popish prelates. When he was released from the tower, to give himself up to the pleasures of the world, to delicateness, to idleness, no, assuredly, but even then, most of all, began to set forth his plow and till the ground of the Lord. And so the good corn of God's word, behaving himself a faithful messenger of God, being afraid of no man, telling all degrees their duties faithfully and truly, without respect of persons or any kind of flattery, Berner tells us that besides all his labors in preaching, despite his advancing age, every morning, ordinarily, winter and summer, about two o'clock in the morning, he was at his book most diligently. With prophetic instinct, he foresaw the troubles with which England was to be afflicted, and he ever affirmed that the preaching of the gospel would cost him his life to which thing he did most cheerfully arm himself.
Alpha Margo Johnson's Thomas Cranmer article by Stephen Sykes on baptism doth represent unto us our profession. Modern hermeneutical theory should alert us to the fact that there is a diversity of ways in which a liturgical text can be read and that the reader should himself or herself become the subject of careful reflection. This is especially careful, especially in the case when one considers that a significant number of those who read, for example, a baptismal liturgy, have themselves been performers of the ritual drama to which it points. It alters one's relation to a text when one has been involved to that degree. And the liturgy of baptism is or should be nothing if not self-involving for all participants, as we shall see. It is perhaps with a difficulty with this line of argument that a text that we shall consider, that of the 1552 Book of Common Prayer is liturgically obsolete, having been repla replaced first by the lightly revised but standard text of 1662, and secondly by the widely used revision of the 1928, an order of the ministration of public baptism of infants. Nonetheless, we shall assume first that Cranmer's 1552 text was substantially retained in later versions and it can be read from the standpoint of the participant. And secondly, such a reading should focus on structures, dramatic actions, rhythms, and repetitions, as well as overt doctrinal content. Anglicans, of course, have a further motive for taking seriously the text of 1662. The Church of England declares in its canon law that its doctrines may be found in the Articles, Prayer Book, and Ordinal. It is true that a later canon qualifies this by speaking of those 16th and 17th century documents in the past tense as this inheritance of faith. But even here it demands from those who make a declaration of assent loyalty to that inheritance as an example how God has guided the church in the past. We turn to Professor McCulloch on Cranmer's life. And we are have been discussing previously the closure of monasteries, the six articles. Cranmer's own particular crucifixion all through July was the business of personally confronting evangelicals with the consequences of the act which involved him in presiding over an examination commission at Lambeth and Croydon. Bishop Sampson was his main colleague, or more accular, accurately, his minder on behalf of other conservative bishops after they'd gone back to their dioceses. Alicius had been a luckier in his escape than another evangelical Scotsman, George Wissert. Wissert appeared before Cranmer and fellow bishops before taking, being taken back to Bristol to do repeated penance, a preparation for the martyrdom which he later suffered in his native land. A senior fellow of All Souls, Oxford, and canon of Lincoln, Lawrence Barber, had a similar experience, although at least according to Fox, he silenced the Episcopal Commission with his use of Augustine in condemnation of official Eucharistic theology. The outcome of a forced recantation. Within the month, the trauma had killed him. The good man wore away, as Fox put it. It was still Calais which rubbed a special salt into Cranmer's wounds. 
John Butler and the rest of Calais radicals formed the largest group in the examinations. And their plight was reported with great satisfaction in a stream of letters back to Lord Lyle. While the deputy and his friends frowned fresh charges, some of them downright absurd, to heap on the opponent. One letter of 13 July in Lyle's Indre would afford him particular delight. It was from Cranmer himself. and was the first open admission of defeat in their tangled six-year relationship. It announced that he was looking for a replacement for Butler as commissary of Kali, and that the new commissary would strictly enforce restrictions on preaching. At elaborate length, Cranmer agreed with Lord Lyle's complaint about people reading the Bible during divine service, contrary to the royal intent. His phrasing about this matter was a striking echo of the proclamation which had not been issued in April. In an extremely revealing letter a week later, Bishop Sampson wrote privately to Lyle, telling him not to gloat in his triumph. In a letter to the examining commissioners at Lambeth, the deputy had not used any of Cranmer's titles. I write it because it is noted, ye shall use your discretion. I would give to every man his honest degree. Sampson, a wiser politician than Lyle, could see that since the whole religious reaction was taking place in the name of unity, this discourtesy was the last thing which the conservative cause required. But formularies to the side, as the Kali evangelicals suffered imprisonment or public penance, all the archbishop could do was plead with Lyle not to exploit their cat catastrophe further in order to bring far fresh charges against them. Butler was banished from Kali, imprisoned in London in the fleet with Broke, an MP, and he only returned to his home to face heresy charges. What a conflicted, confused, disgraceful mess in sinful England. We pick up Arthur Innes, who's talking about authority, and he mentioned that Henry was the authority. Fido or Dense. Defensi, 1529, until his death, 1547. From these considerations, it followed that the Reformation on, under Henry was a constitutional one, structural and financial. Also, by the suppression of the monasteries with their charitable and educational concomitant, it was rendered social, but it was not religious. Uh, we disagree here. He was trying to root out the monks and their loyalty to Rome. Nevertheless, in certain respects, it did pave the way for a religious reformation, that is to say, for an attitude of the mind toward religious questions, 800 houses shut down nationwide. The least important movement was towards checking the extravagance of rights, which were, in the view of all educated people, superstitious, such as the idolatrous worship of shrines, images, and relics, worship in which the material thing tended to assume a sacred character, degenerating from a symbol into a fetish. The exposure of sham relics, the stripping of shrines, and the destruction of images which accompanied the dissolution of monasteries prepared the way for a fiercer iconoclasm, a more sweeping hatred of the sub substitution of things visible or the things of the spirit. More importantly was the tendency which did not begin to develop until after Cranmer's installation to construct new formulae of faith. 
although these formulae never departed appreciably from Orthodox Roman doctrine, they implied uh, the recognition of uncertainties and of distinction between what is of faith and what is of human devising in the ordinance of the church. They admitted the existence of open questions and each restatement of Catholic doctrine carried with it the hints, the implied hints of reformation. While we shift from that, didn't say too much there to Leslie Williams' emblem of faith untouched, we pick up in the year 1536. The year 1536, with the death of Queen Catherine on January 7th, she was banished from the court to live in a series of remote, dank, and unhealthy castles. Catherine never gave up the hope that the marriage between Henry and Anne would fail and reverse her own fortunes. She maintained her own dignity, even hard during the hard times. When one of her noblemen cursed Anne Boleyn, she said, curse her not, but pray for her. For the time will come shortly when you shall have much need to pity and lament her cause. This is early 1536. She also never gave up her title, signing her last letter, Catherine and the Queen. Her funeral service, however, befitted the title Henry had reduced her to, Dowager Princess of Wales, and not the Queen. Cranmer did not attend the funeral, sending Bishop Hilsey as his representative. The same day as Catherine's funeral, Queen Anne miscarried for the second time, and it was a boy. Henry fulminated at the news of the stillborn infant. He was thrown back again into the pit of holy despair. God's judgment was once again punishing him. He told one confident that he had been seduced by witchcraft into this second marriage. He had to do something. Already enamored of Jane Seymour, Henry began making plans. Anne sensed his affections had shifted and feared he was plotting to divorce her. The groupies of two camps surrounding Henry also sensed something different in the wind and began manipulating circumstances to their advantage. The Roman conservatives coached the pliant and quiet Jane Seymour not to give in to Henry before he uttered the magic word of marriage. Meanwhile, on the evangelical side, Cromwell fell out with Anne, possibly over what to do with the monastery money. She wanted to devote it to education and poor relief, and Cromwell didn't want that. And he, Cromwell, turned against her, sealing her fate. During April and May 1536, and it's a bullet train from 18, uh, April 15 to May 31, a total, complete, hypersonic bullet train with a few stop planned stops. Anne's downfall played itself out. It starred a cast of characters choreographed by Henry and his now furious desire to be rid of her. On April 24, 1536, Henry gathered the commission to investigate Anne's treason by way of adultery. We'll detail the six-week period. Trial loss of the head, lapdog Cranmer issuing another nullity, a nullity arrangement, and, and a marriage and coronation by June 1, 1536, all within six weeks. Now turn our attention in Paul Aris's Thomas Cranmer article here on the marriage vow by its place in tradition. He's traced through 
from the 11th century on and the Anglo-Norman, Anglican, Roman rites, the marriage vows, which stressed consent between the two parties. This takes us much further. The vow is now active and not passive. And we have here in embryo the kind of ground plan for what appears a century later. One could translate it into vernacular English and reach something very similar to the Sarah manual vow as that in the prayer book. I take thee to my wedded wife from this day forward as long as we both shall live and there too I plight thee my troth. It would be hard to guess whether the original text was composed in the vernacular or in Latin. But the relationship between the two, a pass, the early passive form of consent from the 12th century, and later the active vow is clearly that of a parent to the child. The Abbey of Burbo had a full form of the vow from the end of the 14th century, which says, I take you as my wife and I espouse you, and I commit you to the fidelity of my body insofar as I bear for you fidelity and loyalty of my body and my possessions. And I will keep you in health and sickness and in any condition which it pleases the Lord that you should have, nor for better nor for better I will change towards you, nor for worse or for better will I change towards you until the end. We are now clearly into another kind of liturgical text, a mini-speech in vernacular form. The same basic theological themes recur, fidelity, lifelong commitment, whatever state of health should obtain. But these have been elaborated. It is an object lesson in liturgical development. It would be hard to suggest that there was some unknown and lost archetype, but there is a clear relationship between Burbo and the earlier simpler forms. It is, is as if the 14th century were supplying its own foliage on an already grown tree. We'll pick this up with the 15th century manuals of marriage. As we turn to Jasper Ridley, and he's talking about Catherine Howard in the post after the another nullity arrangement to get rid of Anne of Cleves so he could marry this lynx. This was not a propaganda statement, nor was it as far as we know shown to Henry for his approval or anyone else. It was a private letter to an old and intimate friend to his most beloved Osiander. Oh, this is where Cranmer writes a letter to Osiander about the double standards of the Lutherans authorizing Philip of Hesse for a bigamous marriage. And Cranmer has taken knocks and hits from continental reformers and people at home in which Cranmer could safely express his true opinions about the marriage. But for Cranmer, it was a great opportunity to justify to himself his estrangement from Lutheranism. Not only did he call the Lutherans introducers of novelties, this is December 27, 1540, Cromwell has already died, a phrase which was so often used by the orthodox fashion when they referred to reformers. But he ended his letter with a veiled threat of a complete breach with Lutheranism. He told Ossiander that his acquaintance with the other Lutheran theologian had always been a slight one. And even of this, I confess, I should repent very much if I know that these were the fruits of the new gospel of which they boast so much, and which was also approved of by us to some extent until now, not without reason as we thought. 
the bigamous marriage in Hess was a convenient excuse for a reformer <coughs> who had turned his back on the Reformation and was supporting the six articles. Very nice, Jasper. Cranmer's now spent a great deal of time attending meetings of the Privy Council, which since the fall of Cromwell had played an increasing part in the detailed administration of the country. He dealt with the fortifications in Calais and on the Scottish border with punishment of forgers and men who poached in the parks of great noblemen and with payments from the royal treasury. The great machine interfered in every aspect of the king's subjects, enforcing its authority with the savage punishments of the royal despotism in defiance of the old rules of English common law. Cranmer and his colleagues sentenced criminals to have their ears nailed to the pillory. The responsibility for the execution of this punishment was on the occasion delegated to Cranmer or to suffer other forms of mutilation. And they sometimes resorted to the use of torture on unconvicted prisoners, which was repugnant to the common law. They ordered deportation and execution of gypsies and the punishment of thieves and vagabonds. According to the contemporary estimate, 72,000 persons were hanged during the reign of Henry VIII, nearly two and a half percent of the total population of England. Cranmer's part in all these measures was doubtless largely formal, but the man who ranked first among all the lords of the council cannot avoid the moral responsibility for the orders which were issued. On this point, at least Cranmer's conscience was at ease for he was serving his master and was enforcing in the executive sphere the absolute autocracy, which he advocated so zealously as a propagandist. Wow. Here we bring this to an end. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end.